Okay. Uh, laser pointer and the two arrows to go back and forth. Okay. Hello. Yes. Good morning. So uh, now you're going to present a bit about block oscillations for atoms. So our group is Lucia, Luis, and Lucas. Uh, so it's it's one of the first papers from this topic in which they are able to do experimentally those block oscillations with atoms. And the, the this paper is relevant because yeah, so it was relate it was on at that time that they start to produce experimentally those oscillations, and there those shows uh, they, they show on the paper the experiment how did they perform the experiment, but also it is interesting because they they provide different views for the same phenomena, so it is really help us to understand what is happening, and and uh, like in our view it is one of the very important contribution this pers this this way to not just to show the experiment but to present different views in order to interpret what's happening. So those different views are related to the, the standard uh, solid state explanation for the phenomenon, but also uh, quantum optics interpretation of what is happening. And as a consequence to producing those block oscillations, they are, they, they are able to produce monokinetic atomic beams that are atomic beams that have a very uh, uh, narrow momentum distribution. So for this, uh, in this perspective of, of condensate matter, what is happening is that we, we can, uh, and they, they, they have this cesium, uh, cesium atom, and they can produce a cloud of it, and they cool down, and the, the experimental process is in a way that they, 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 they start with the, a ground state, and they have two uh, lasers that is blue and red related to a resonance of the atom, and starting from this ground state, this blue detuned laser makes the atom excite be excited in a virtual state. So as it is in a virtual state, it is not able to, to produce any uh, radiation. So this is a non-radiative process. It's a non-radiative decay because after being on this virtual state, the atom will, uh, by the interaction with the other laser, it will emit one photon on the direction of the laser, so this, the interpretation of what's happening. And by this process, it will be in another virtual state that will be on this, uh, uh, this fundamental band. And the idea that we can interpret the, the, the amplitude of probability of re in relation to what's happening here is that you'll be oscillating on this, uh, on this band. But this is a pictorial view of what's happening, but what is happening is that the, the atom, it's gained some momentum, and in the end, it is, there is no change on the internal degrees of freedom of atom. So here is to show the different internal degrees of atom, but we know that for this process, there is no change of those degrees of freedom. What's happening is that the, the, the atom is gaining some momentum from the, from the blue. Uh, so yeah, we are on this non-relative de decay in which the, the atom is not emitting any photon in, in the end of the process. It's, it's, it's gaining some energy, but there is no change of real photon, no emission of real photon on the process. Uh, okay. So it's the laser here. And who did that? Um, I'm going to talk about the experimental setup. Uh, the idea is that uh, they want to mimic a system um, with uh, electrons in a crystal, uh, in a perfect crystal, uh, under an electromagnetic uh, field. But they do it with um, uh, this, um, sorry. <laughs> they do it with um, the this optical lattice. So uh, first uh, you need to cool down the, the atoms and uh, you do it with a magneto-optical trap and uh, then you shut down the um, magnetic field to keep uh, cooling the atoms until uh, six mic microkelvins. Uh, and then they need to even cool more the atoms with um, with this kind of of lasers, 
uh, is called ramen cooling, and uh, they do that because they need to cool uh, match the atoms uh, to to produce um, a cloud that the um, uh, velocity um, distribution is less than the first Brillouin um, zone. So they want to move only in the first Brillouin zone. Uh, then they um, cut down one of the the red the they shoot down the red laser and use only the blue laser to here uh, with a, a small detuning between uh, this this beam and this beam uh, and the detuning between between the two laser beams they um, uh, change it with time uh, li with linear with time. So the in this way you can produce um, a, a external force to the atoms and they acel accelerate. Um, and then to measure, uh, it's not here, but they excite um, between this level and this level and uh, measure the fluorescence. Uh, they can do that uh, with a selective velocity um, excitement. So you can, uh, in this way, know uh, the velocity of the, the, um, the atoms, like the, um, the quantity of atoms with each velocity. So, uh, bon dia, San Paulo, first of all. <laughs> now we are going to to see the same system, but we are going uh, to study a different uh, theoretical in, uh, model. But uh, we are of, of course we are looking the same system, so we will get the same idea, same results. What uh, what we what we have here is that if you uh, like step in the laboratory frame of reference, uh, what we will see is basically um, uh, three atoms that are in a inside like an in like an in a um, stationary uh, wave of light, and uh, this light, as Lucia said, it, ha it has a, um, a drift on the difference of frequency between the two lasers that forms the, the stationary wave. So, s as we don't have a, a spontaneous emissions in this system, the momentum of the atoms um, will change. Uh, like absorbing a photon from this uh, W1 uh, omega 1 um, a photon of, of frequency of omega 1 and emitting a photon of frequency omega 2. And this uh, is detuned from the uh, transition to the exact excited state. So, uh, it's as Louis said, this will not make a change on the electronic state of the atom, but it will make a change on the uh, momentum uh, state of the atom. And uh, as the momentum spread is much smaller than uh, 2HK, the and uh, the kinetic energy is near to zero because uh, we the atoms are really good. Recalled, um, uh, we have that this uh, momentum, these changes in momentum are uh, discretized. So uh, when we do one of these processes, what we have is that we go from um, uh, a state that in momentum energy does. Uh, in this case, if you have uh, j equal to zero, is uh, zero and uh, basically uh, zero, and then you can make these uh, steps one to one, uh, where, as I said, the momentum is um, proportional to this 2HK, the change is in momentum, and in the energy, you will have to uh, that the gain in kinetic energy is proportional to year that is proportional to uh, the wavelength shift that, as, uh, as we said, is um, changing linearly over time. So, uh, to show a result that they got, um, the this method of uh, this method of um, exciting the transition between two energy levels with an electromagnetic wave uh, of variable detuning is known as uh, adiabatic 
uh, rapid passage or RIP. And uh, what you see is uh, in the uh, laboratory frame is uh, the following. You have, um, and in this graph what we see is population of the momentum transfer uh, against time and uh, mean, mean atomic velocity against time. So um, what we see in the population of the momentum states is that uh, you start with uh, say uh, p equal to zero and uh, remember that uh, this time um, that as we have a frequency drift that's linear with time uh, also these plots are uh, are against uh, this frequency drift and what we s what we see is that with this uh, linear drift we don't have a linear uh, gain on the momentum but we have this uh, discretized behavior and what we have is uh, that as we can see here we have all the population in the p equals zero state and then after a little bit of time you two minutes game over <laughs> um i'm finishing already and after a little bit of time you um have all of your population in p equal to hk and then the the if you keep uh, doing this you will have all of your population in p equal to 4 hk state and uh, what you see in the laboratory system of reference is that um, the momentum is uh, also um, augmenting in um, discretized steps. Uh, so in this way, it is possible to drive the system through a, se through a sequence of intermediate states. So you go to here, to here, to here. And in this way, uh, with this, you can uh, have a monokinetic atomic beam because you can uh, choose the state in when you stop doing this and you will find the state in the state you prepare with some momentum and particular energy. So uh, that's it. Thank you for your attention. Hello, uh, everyone. So, okay. So, I will give brief idea about the paper spin orbit coupled spinal bow sensing condensation. So, uh, bow sensing condensation. The first experimental uh, realization of spin orbit uh, bow sensing condensation was in magnetic trap that is terming as a scalar condensate and in an optical in an optical trap a spin f atom representing uh, 2f plus 1 hyperfine state corresponding to the spin projection quantum number uh, where mf is going to minus f to f uh, that would uh, otherwise be frozen in magnetic trap basically in uh, magnetic trap there would be only one spin of atom can trap in bec but in an optical trap let's say for spin 1 there would be three hyperfine state plus 1 minus 1 and uh, 0 they all can trap uh, at the same time so in an optical trap Another striking consequences of spin degree of freedom is spin dynamics because there are multi-spin component in a system so they can interact and they can exchange their spin. Uh, 
so uh, in spinal condensate uh, rather than uh, scalar condensate several phases are possible uh, depend upon the nature of interaction uh, they experience so far uh, spin 1 ru in rubidium spin 1 in sodium spin 2 in rubidium 87 spin 3 in chromium all these has been experimentally realized so Okay, so spin orbit coupling. The main work is spin orbit coupling in spinal condensate in this paper has been done. So spin orbit coupling is an interaction between a quantum particle spin and its momentum. So as ultra coiled atoms or coiled atoms are neutral atoms, so there would be no natural uh, spin orbit coupling occur between them. But there would be a synthetic spin orbit coupling can be engineered by controlling the atom light interaction leading to the generation of artificial uh, non-abelian gauge potential that couple to the atom. So first experimental uh, realization of spin orbit coupling uh, was engineered by a by using a pair of laser lights which give equal uh, which give rise the equal strength of Rashba spin orbit coupling and Russell Hoss spin orbit coupling so uh, i would like to say that spin orbit coupling experimental realization of spin orbit coupling in bc is a very big achievement uh, for a cold atoms because it gives a very uh, big platform to study the uh, different and uh, non trivial structures in uh, bc uh, to the uh, researcher so <coughs> In this paper, basically, uh, uh, the authors have considered two uh, systems, spin half system and spin one system in the presence of spin orbit coupling. So uh, the model they have considered, uh, <coughs> uh, the Hamiltonian can be written as for spin half atom. They, this would be corresponding to a single particle. And there would be a uh, large number of atom in the uh, condensate. So they uh, must experience some kind of interaction among them. So this would be corresponding to the interaction term. So uh, for a spin half system, there would be two components. Uh, and uh, the order parameter for that can be uh, written as a column vector for spin up and spin down. And this term is corresponding to the kinetic energy. And these terms corresponding to the spin orbit coupling. And these two are showing the interaction between two uh, components, C0 and C2. These are basically <coughs> linear combination of G up and G down and G up and down simultaneously. Basically, these are the, let's say, two components. There would be intercomponent interaction and there would be intracomponent interaction. So for spin one, uh, the model has been considered. Say the order parameter psi would be uh, the uh, column vector for three component. And these C node and C2 are the interaction uh, for, um, among the spin components. So, so uh, in spinal condensate, basically, <coughs> there would be uh, more um, more phases has been observed. So uh, here, that would depend upon the value of interaction we have chosen. So C naught would be positive for spin half and spin one, and the, this ratio uh, C two divided by C naught, basically C two, that can be positive or negative depend upon the atom we have considered. That would be sodium, rubidium, etc. So, uh, so if I talk about the numerical simulation of the model, then one has to solve uh, the gross Petrovsky energy per particle, uh, this energy. Uh, basically, on the behalf of this energy, uh, one can decide that the state would be ground state or the, the excited state. So uh, the, the there would be many methods which have been discussed in paper can be used to solve the model numerically. So I will not discuss. I'm going going to discuss here. So <coughs> the numerical simulation for spin half phase. Uh, they uh, they have observed two kind of phases uh, for spin half system, uh, which has not been observed without spin orbit coupling earlier. There would be a plane wave phase. This is the phase corresponding to the uh, plane wave structure, plane wave as a ground state solution, and this would be the stripe pattern. <coughs> so. For the spin one uh, system also, if uh, the ratio of C2 by uh, C0 is positive, then there would be stripe pattern we will observe as a ground state solution. If the ratio is negative, then there would be plane wave as a ground state solution. OK, uh, now I will conclude the talk. Uh, so in this paper, they have considered two systems in the presence of spin orbit coupling, spin half and spin one, both sense in condensation. The coupling they have considered that is Ashwa spin orbit coupling. And uh, uh, with numerical simulation, they have identified the two phases. 
and in one phase there uh, there is a plane wave phase and the other one is a stripe phase and the transition between these two phases can be driven by uh, tuning the interaction uh, among the atoms so thank you So you have talked about the multi-component. Yeah. So what about in single component in uh, spin-off coupling? Sorry? What about uh, spin-off coupling in single component? Because the spin-off coupling is the coupling between the uh, the, uh, then a single component, there would be no spin orbit coupling. This can be only multi-component system. At least two components there should be there. Like uh, spin half, there would be two component spin up and down. So for a single component, there would be no spin orbit coupling. OK, thank you. Thank you. Good morning, guys. Uh, my name is Mateus and Mateus and Michael. We are to show uh, show you prospect for a million heads line with laser paper review article for. Uh, 2009, uh, this motivate for this article is uh, proposed with the main object to create a new light search uh, that has alkaline atoms uh, in optical letters do the detection of photos on an ultra narrow clock transition into the more, uh, the more high Q resonator. What is a Q resonator? Uh, in physics, uh, in, in January, a Q resonator is uh, a, a, dimension of, uh, a dimensionless uh, parameter that describes how in the dampened an oscillator or resonator is. So uh, we, f we talk about the main problem about this paper. The result optical radiate has an extremely narrow line width and milliarad scale. Even smaller than the clock transition itself do the collector effects. Oh, then the light search has a potential to improve the stability of the best clocks by two orders of, of magnitude. It's important to emphasize that the standard of frequency and clocks have many applications in physics and technologies. Some, em some examples, GPS, radio astronomy, and tests of fundamental laws of physics. Optical clocks based on IOS and ultracode have been, have been shown a very precision by comparing the prime assess, uh, the primum microwave standard, primary says microwave standards. So uh, the stability of this, 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 this south light is very, it's very better than another uh, light source uh, orders. So uh, optical atomic clocks do not achieve the full stability that in principle is provided by the atomic transitions on which they are based. In order to resolve this problem, would be to directly extract light emitted from the ultra narrow, ultra narrow clock transition. In further, 
it's not it's not practical for applicants because its fluorescent light is too weak. The key observation for this works is that we could interact the ensemble of the atoms to emit the energy story and then collectively rate it and dividend. We could be possible a lot and enough technology relevant. We will focus on the example of the strontium confinite and a lattice lattice potential to make the present clear and concise. The results, however, can be translated another atoms with uh, with uh, is, uh, similar extra true uh, or, or in the other end, alkaline earths like system atoms. Well, um, as my partner told you, uh, we are dealing with the construction, or well, the author was dealing with the construction of a high cavity, uh, a high Q cavity with the atoms enclosed in this lattice potential. In this case, uh, we're dealing with, or well, the author was dealing with um, uh, the strontium atoms. Uh, in this case, we have and strontium atoms, and we have this scheme. I don't know why this doesn't work. <laughs> uh, well, you can see we have the we have a two-level system for these for these atoms. We are considering the ground state and the excited state. We consider that there is a frequency transition that is omega a, and uh, we have also spontaneous emission that is represented by this gamma. Uh, but this is not the only process that is occurring here. We also have a repumping of the laser that occurs at a, um, at a rate of repump uh, W, we can call it. And um, this repump is going, to, is going to, to take the atom to other levels, the 3P1 and the 3S1 that you can see in the diagram. So... Uh, how did they construct the, the cavity? These are the parameters. Uh, you have the cooperativity of the atoms in, in the cavity. You have the effective volume, the finesse of the cavity, and also the cavity line width. The idea is that uh, the author was dealing, uh, in, um, was dealing with this problem in, in the resonance, in the resonance, um, in the resonance scheme where uh, the, the cavity line width and the, and the resonance frequency of the cavity uh, was also the frequency of the transition, omega a, that I showed you later, uh, before, sorry. Uh, so, uh, the idea is that uh, the construction of the cavity uh, can give us the collective effect that we want to establish to make this super radiant uh, emission of fluorescence that uh, will also allow us to get this uh, millihertz line with laser. So uh, this is the couple atom cavity is a Hamiltonian of the system. This is the Rari frequency and these are the Pauli matrices that uh, describe the atomic states. Uh, the idea is to solve the master equation for the reduced atom cavity density matrix uh, where we have here the Liouvillian operator that includes uh, the Liouvillian operator of the cavity, the Liouvillian operator of the spontaneous emission, the Liouvillian operator of inhomogeneous processes, and the Liouvillian operator of the repump process. The idea is to find the steady state solution of this equation uh, because that state is uh, that steady state solution is going to allow us to to obtain the collective coupling of atoms and the light field and this is also going to allow us build up uh, this is going to allow the build up of collective dipoles and this is the key idea to this uh, stronger emission of radiation for the fluorescence process so uh, to get this steady state solution, uh, we make an expansion in second order cumulants of the expected values of the system's observables. And uh, we get to this equation the, the temporal evolution of the spin spin correlations. 
So uh, the fir these equations that I enclosed in the in the green in, in the green box represent the exchange of energy between atoms and cavity, and the purple square, the terms that uh, the term that is in the purple square represents the couple of atom cavity coherence uh, uh, to the spin spin correlations. Um, so, the main idea now is to understand the role of the collective effects. Uh, if we uh, solve these equations, making approximations, this one that I put here, uh, if we make some approximations and we consider only the case where the, the tuning, uh, this delta that you can see here, is equal to zero, uh, that is the case that I told you before that it's when the resonance cavity uh, coincides with the with the frequency of transition, uh, we obtain this equation that is the physically stable solution for the spin-spin correlations. Um, this equation allows us to define what uh, the author calls the laser threshold. And that's a, the laser threshold corresponds to the condition that is necessary for uh, getting these collective, uh, this collective effects and obtain this super radiant condition for the uh, for the fluorescence atoms. Uh, in this case, the condition is this one that I enclose in the red box, that uh, the repumping rate has to be greater than the, um, this gamma represents the, the, um, the, ah, I forgot, um, the spontaneous emission. So, uh, if this condition is unset, uh, it is going to be also unset of the collective behavior. Oh, the time's over. Ah, so, so, in this figure, we can see the, the power as function of the number of the atoms and the pump rate. The power of the atoms increases rapidly above the threshold and keep increasing in until the the second threshold when it's destroyed. Uh, by the equa equation that Michael presents to us, we can obtain the maximum spin-spin correlation that is given by the first equation. And obtain for the pump ratio that is the second equation. At this pump rate, we can reach the maximum power that is given by this first equation. So at this power, we can achieve a uh, power with is by a factor two smaller than the perfect super the perfect super radiation emission and in the figure we can see that the power can achieve a value of of above 10 to the power of minus 12 for a number of 10 to the power of six atoms here we can see a graph of the line width and the gamma is our first threshold. After this, the line width rapidly decreases with the increase of the pump rate. After this, when the pump rate reaches the, the second threshold, given by T2, the atoms is space locked together. And due to the noise of the pump rate, the line width is basically constant. So, the article also says that the, this line width can is proportional to the cooperative parameter of the cavity multiplied by the factor gamma. And this can be under the homogeneous line width of the atomic clock transition. transition. So, game over. <laughs> Finally, the, the, they say that the narrow line width can be observed if the cavity resonance frequency is stable at one kilohertz. 1 kilohertz level, which is relat relatively easy to achieve experimentally. Also, when the pump rate achieved increases beyond the pump rate maximum, indicated by the third dashed line in this graph, the collective dipole is destroyed and the line width increases rapidly until it is eventually given by the pump rate. And they end f saying that the first future research is targeted to uh, fully understand the required effects and the detailed nature of the joint atomic and fluid state. Thank you.
download the currency graph presentation. Since the next group term now is the presentation while I update the No, no. Uh, so pointer, let's say. <laughs> okay, guys. So I am Shayla. She's Stephanie. He's Tel. So we will we'll talk about this. This paper here, that is continuous variable entanglement in an optical parametric oscillator based on non-generated full wave mixes process in whole talcally atoms. A lot of things, right? So let's begin. Uh, the first thing that we, need, we can remind here, oh, let me just talk about. This is, this is a uh, experiment that was made for, for, with, for people here, from here, Sao Paulo, in collaboration with people from Oklahoma, US. So this works here. Uh, this work here, guys, studied one of the, the concepts that they work with is, is tangle, quantum entanglement. So let us remind qu quickly what is quantum entanglement. So uh, the idea of quantum entanglement is when you have a, a global state of a particle, uh, of two particles even more, that cannot be described separately one particle from another. So the global state, the state, the final state of one particle, uh, kind of depends on the state of the other particle. For example, uh, excuse me. For example, here, imagine that you, uh, that you have two particles A and B, and the state of these particles can be, or spin up, or spin down. Okay. Uh, if this is the individual possible states of these particles. When, do, when they are entangled, one, e one example is that one here. Here we have a superposition of, the of state of two entangled particles, uh, two particle states that is spin, a uh, particle A can be spin up and particle B spin down or particle A can be spin in on a spin down state and particle B in spin up state. So what this means is that if I measure, for example, my particle A and find a spin up, this means that particle B shall be, shall be in, in the spin down state. So this is the idea of quantum entanglement. And uh, what they did in this work was to, study, to try to measure quantum entanglement in continuous variables. So they use it. I think I'll let O is uh, optical parametric oscillator where uh, they enter with some beam here and here leaves other two beams and they try to see how these beams that it is going outside of this optical parametric oscillator here can be entangled. For do this they use it uh, a mean with susceptibility key three and the, to do this, they use a uh, concept called uh, uh, four wave mixing. Uh, the idea is that this was made before, but just for key two. Uh, guys at the past uh, tried to make that a APR, APR uh, experiment proposed by Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen. And they tried to do this and made that they could do this for, I mean, key two. But here in this work, they do this for key theory. For so now, Tell we will explain you the ideas of optical parametric oscillator and the idea of four wave mixing. Well, I'll make just a, a small recall. Of course, uh, uh, we're working with four wave mixing. So as many of you have seen in, in the lab that you have seen the University of São Paulo, we're going to have two photons. Well, uh, the optical parametric oscillator is just uh, you have a nonlinear mean inside a cavity. You shine a pump laser, and in the case of this experiment, we are going to have uh, two photons of the pump being annihilated, 
and we are going to create one photon for the for the the probe and the other for the idler. And of course, as we are working with continuous variables, uh, we are going to have a range of frequencies here. And if you, we go like an omega frequency uh, is smaller and one bigger, we're going to have what we call the sidebands. And are in those sidebands that they found the most interesting results. So, so I will speak about the experiment set up for the experiment. The OPO consists of both eye cavity with high reflective mirrors and the free spectral band of 404.7 megahertz and allow a doubling a resonant a par, a resonant operator a par of beams. So these beams which correspond to atomic between atomic energy of the atomic energy hyperfine division of the ground state of 85 rubidium and the pump beam the pump beam is coli uh, is collinear with the cavity uh, mode and injected in the system with polarized beam splitter one and removed by polarized beam splitter two. So the bomb is generated with the titan sapphire laser and the laser is, is tuned so close the line, D1 line of the 85 rubidium, about 795 nanometers to correspond to the, uh, and the frequency is stabilized so there is a has a detune to 0 0.82 gigahertz to the blue so this frequency corresponds to transition to a stage of 5s one and a half to 5p one and a half so the PBS tree and the half wave plate use it to control the cavity output and uh, uh, generate field are degenerated by polarization and separate by tephron, Mark Zender and tephron here. And the beams will be analyzed by, uh, in two cavities on a PC. So this whole system, there is a 19.1% 90, of efficient and the four wave mix process occur, occurs in the inside the cavity, so all right, inside the cavity and uh, the in 85 rubidium vapor cells, and headed to 97 degrees gross degrees Celsius for the high optical density is required for our efficient four wave mix process. So this whole experiment is a. Uh, Quantum is a tomography of the quantum states. So Theo will discuss with the results. Uh, well, of course, I need to remember you guys because it doesn't have a here in the slide. In slide, but uh, as we're working with continuous variables to verify mainly the entanglement, we will use the one criteria that we'll see that if we have the variancy of the sum of the phases, so we have the phase of the first beam with the second one, P being the, the phase, uh, plus the variance of the difference in the amplitudes. So we have like, uh, we are going to call QA minus QB. Uh, this needs to be uh, greater than two. So if we have the violation of this criteria, we are going to have uh, verified entanglement. And here we can see like this quantity and of course, we are hearing, comparing it to the, to the input power. So it's just normalized by the threshold power because we need to remember that in this experiment, we are working with the NOPO above the, the threshold value. Uh, and we can see that they have for all this spectrum, they have entanglement. And they have also seen this changing the temperature of the cell uh, inside the OPO. So we see that if we increase the, the temperature, which will increase the density, it will reduce the entanglement. And then what they did uh, next was to reconstruct, as we are making uh, tomography of the field, the covariance matrix for those sidebands that I have uh, talked about. 
So we are going to compare all the bipartitions that we're going to have in our system with the upper and lower sidebands of the two output fields. And what we will find is that, uh, well, you can see <laughs> here, but uh, most, uh, almost all of them are going to be entangled. And here we have it again for the, again for the input power, but we're going to have this for three different finesses of our cavity. So it's going to be more open or more closed. We're going to have a bigger or smaller uh, opening of the cavity. And then we have the same observation for the temperature again here. And this again, we have the uh, I strong correlation between the four modes. So we have entanglement in many of the bipartitions of the output uh, for many different temperatures and and uh, and finances. So the conclusions that the authors has is that the OPO is a robust way uh, using the nonlinear medium uh, of the rubidium uh, uh, vapor. It's, it has some advantages, advantages compared to the ordinary uh, crystals that people use uh, with second order nonlinearities because with the temperature we can control the gain and with a better control of the gain that we have, uh, we can also have uh, a smaller uh, finesse which will increase the, the ratio of the beams that stay oscillating in the cavity and that comes out of it. So in, in a general way, it's, it's been shown that it's a robust way to generate uh, integral pairs for experiments in many other fields of quantum optics and atomic physics. I'm curious, uh, when you increase the temperature, it's actually uh, quite, uh, uh, so, this, okay. temp this one with this one or yes, with the? This one, <laughs> no, this one uh, that you showed. This is one. So is this, uh, in yeah, okay, it's in degrees, it's a very small change of temperature, but you, and you destroy your entanglement. Uh, what happens, uh, does the density change so much from 98 uh, degrees to Yes, the density changes really much because the, the size of the cell that we have is really small. And when you increase the temperature, as it has a smaller uh, pressure inside, uh, the density increases really, uh, it quickly increases. And as the density will quickly increase, um, as is discussed in the paper, it will increase the number of atoms and will increase the, the, the chance of an absorption. Okay, so what is the change in density from uh, 98 to 100? Uh, they in the article, they doesn't mention what ch the change of the density is okay. in, in the number. What? Yeah, the, the, the of course the optical density, uh, but it doesn't mention like numerically what it is. They just uh, deal directly with the temperature okay. because you, you can't actually like go inside of the cell uh, and measure it. So you just can mm -hmm. theoretically expect what it's going to be. Okay. Okay. Uh, nice time. So, good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, my name is Patricia, and he's Pedro Henrique, and we are going to talk about this paper here, Multiple Scattering of Light by Atoms in the Weak Localization Regime. So, it's, uh, it was published in 2000 as a physical review letters, and it is in the same context as the presentation of the previous group, so at some context, so some concepts will appear again, so I'm sorry about it, but, I mean, there is no solution for this. So the paper starts, it starts discussing uh, what happens when an inst when sorry uh, when a monochromatic wave is scattered by uh, 
by a disordered medium. And it, what happens is that the intensity pattern that this uh, disordered medium gives rise uh, is something like this, can be something like this, which is called sp speckle. So we have this distribution of the intensity, which depends heavily on the other fluctuations. So each of these pictures here that I am showing you is a different realization of this. So however, when we have the weak localization regime, which means that we are working with dilute disordered medium, and we average over the scattered position, we have instead of patterns like this one here. There is, however, an exception, which is when we have this situation here, so when we have waves A and B, uh, so we have, we have wave, wave A uh, scattering through this path here, and wave B in the exactly reverse path. In this case, what happens is that these waves interfere constructively, which enhances the average fuel's reflected intensity, a phenomenon that is called coherent backscattering. So to discuss coherent backscattering, the authors define this average intensity here, which is the sum of three terms. This first one is the single scattering terms, the second one the ladder terms, and the last one the maximally crossed terms. So these first two, they don't account for any interference terms, it's all uh, contained in this last one here, which is the one that will give rise to the CBS contribution. So to evaluate the CBS contribution, they define this ratio here between the total intensity to the background uh, in this backward direction, so we have theta equals to zero. And if you look at this expression, we will see that when IS is equals to zero and IL equals to IC, we have the maximum possible value for this enhancement, which is equal to two. And this situation here can happen with classical scatterers uh, in some specific situations. So what this paper tried to show is that because of some uh, experimental observations with CBS, uh, with cold atom experiments, it was observed low enhancement factors than this value of two here, and they attribute this uh, to the quantum internal structure of the atoms that needs to be taken into account. So what they show is that IS is different than zero instead of equals to zero, and the amplitudes uh, interfering for the, the CBS, they are not in general reciprocal with some condition that we have to, to have in order to IC to be equals to IL. So in this case, when we consider the quantum internal structure of the atoms, we have IC smaller than IL. So in the system that they consider, uh, they have this collection of atoms with ground state characterized by angular momentum J and excited state characterized by angular momentum J prime. And they, uh, they shine a weak monochromatic light almost close to the resonance. And they show with some math and also in the experiments that in fact we have IS different than zero and IC less smaller than IL, which leads to uh, an enhancement factor less than two. So picking up where uh, Patricia ended, I'm going to give an, an example, an illustrative example of when the maximally crossed term is lesser than the latter term. We're going to be considering a double scattering on two atoms without change of internal state. So the before and after scattering states are the same. Uh, we're considering a situation where the total angular momentum from the two atoms are one half, both before and after the scattering. So we should have also uh, J, J prime one and J prime two equals to one half. And we're gonna be looking at the parallel circular uh, polarization channel with positive incident uh, helicity. This is an image taken from the article we're representing. It shows uh, both situations, the direct path and the reversed path. And the atoms we're considering, atom one is in initial state uh, minus one half, n equals minus one half, and the atom two is in the state plus one half, n equals plus one half. In the direct path, we can see that the atom can absorb the positive helicity photon and re-emit it as a negative helicity, uh, as a negative helicity photon. Uh, then it, it can be scattered by atom two, can be absorbed and re-emit it as a positive helicity photon. Uh, but in the second case, 
the, atom, the reverse path, the atom two cannot absorb the positive helicity photon because there isn't an m equals three halves in the excited state. So we can see that this case here, we have a vanishing transition. And this is a clear case where the uh, maximally crossed term does not contribute at all to the backscattering, to the backscattering enhancement. Then the actors, the authors of the article, propose a theoretical model to calculate the enhancement factors. Uh, they consider a double scattering of a photon from an initial to a final state of momentum and polarization. Uh, they calculate the transition amplitudes uh, in terms of the klebsch gordon coefficients. And they consider the atoms are uniformly distributed in half space. And the initial distribution of internal, sta of internal states is a complete statistical mixture, which is likely to happen in a experimental setup. They take two different approaches. In the first one, they basically calculate the transition amplitudes for uh, all the combinations of initials and final states, and then they sum all uh, over all possible uh, states. Uh, in the second approach, they derive analytical expressions for single and double scattering, and they come to the conclusion that both approaches give the same results. Here I'm gonna show you a comparison between their theoretical calculations and the experimental observations. Uh, on the um, orthogonal circular polarization channel with rubidium atoms considering transitions from uh, J equals three to J equals four. This is the result they get. The solid line represents the experimental observations and the dashed line represents their theoretical model considering both single and double scattering and the internal structure of the atoms as well. Uh, with their theoretical model, they were able to calculate the enhancement factors on the various different channels of polarization. And they made a table. This is the table they get. The first column, we, get the re we have the results considering double scattering only. In the second column, we consider both single and double scattering. And this is the comparison with the experimental value. And we see that they get a, a fairly good agreement with the experiments. This is all. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, today, we're going to present this paper called Squishing and Entanglement in Bose-Einstein Condensate. Uh, to start the motivation, uh, we want to motivate the use of uh, spin squeeze states, and uh, the, the direct application is using atom interferometry. So here we present uh, a scheme of how an at atom interferometer is gonna work. Basically, we apply pulses, by half pi and pi half pulses, and we already know that that means rotations with respect to the block sphere. So basically, uh, the interferometer is gonna work using the measurements of the final states of uh, internal states of the atoms. So uh, the idea of any interferometer is uh, measuring the angle, in this call, the angle phi. So in this scheme, we can see that uh, we have the difference between the initial state here and the final state here, uh, kinda uh, shifted by the angle phi that we want to measure. And already with Philip, we saw that the, the, the projection noise is adding some uh, noise to the measurement uh, because of uh, the measurement itself. So for us, it could be much, uh, basically the, the accuracy of our interferometer is gonna depend 
on the distinguishability between the initial state and the final state. So we, if we compare a uh, coherent state, which is shown here, with a squeezed state, of course, we kind of agree that we prefer a squeezed state to make better measurements. Do we agree? Yes? Okay. So here is a representation of uh, in the block sphere uh, about this concept. So basically, we see that uh, in the coherent state, we have the equivalence between the projection noise with the shot noise. So basically, these states are the most critical states in which we can measure uh, in, an atom in an atom interferometer. But uh, to produce squeezed states, uh, well, basically, we need uh, nonlinear interaction to produce squeezed states. And that's not kind of, it's kind of not a surprise for us because we already know a process where uh, squeezing is happening. If we consider uh, harmonic potential, we know in the, in, the, in the ground state that we have less fluctuations in the, in the bottom of the, of, the harmonic or the, of the harmonic potential because we know where is the particle, but we have greater uh, fluctuations in the, uh, the extreme of the potential. And uh, of course, this is happening because we have an interaction which is nonlinear already because as we remember, uh, the Hamiltonian is nonlinear. Nonlinear. So one way of uh, making squeezing defined is using nonlinear Hamiltonians, and has been done in photons. And also here is an example with a particle in a potential, but in sp in spin is a little bit more involved because if you remember the commutation relations are more are harder. So for us, the, our figure of interest is going to be this parameter, which is called the spin parameter, which is basically the ratio between these two quantities representing our objectives, which are reducing the projection noise and increasing the sensitivity of the interferometer. Our interferometer has to be the highest uh, visibility possible. So uh, uh, spin squeezing is a very general phenomenon, but here we want to focus it on both Einstein condensations. Specifically, we will use an optical lattice on top of a harmonic trap in order to control how many wells we are working with. Um, just taking into account two wells, we can define a super s an spin effective superstructure using the corresponding creation and destruction operators, as you can see here. And then uh, this will generate two new quadratures, which will be the focus of this work, which are the number of particles uh, in each well and the phase difference between the macroscopic uh, wave functions on each well. Um, and the f objective will be to uh, squeeze uh, the number of atoms. But uh, we need one more ingredient uh, for this to happen, which is a nonlinear interaction. The advantage is that this system already has a nonlinear interaction, which is given by the interparticle interaction in the gross pitayevsky equation for, uh, for a local interaction on each well. Regarding the experiment, uh, we have to measure two things. One is the number of atoms, and two is the phase difference. For the number of atoms, we use absorption imaging with a precision of one micrometer, which is enough since we have a distance between wells of 5.7 micrometers. Then, uh, for the phase difference, we first have the, the Bose-Einstein condensate in the lattice. We turn off the lattice, and uh, we leave it to interact between adjacent wells. Uh, we do it for a short time only so that the next neighbor interaction is possible and then we measure the fringe pattern and from that fringe pattern and a Fourier transfer we can obtain the phase difference. At the end we measure many times and we obtain these histograms and from here we can already see squeezing uh, from the green curve. Okay, so how do I point this? I don't know how to <coughs> Oh, here, okay. So uh, here we can define a number squeezing operator based on the, the spin squeeze operators. And uh, how do you know uh, the amplitude operator, uh, the amplitude quadrature has its, co uh, its conjugate, uh, uh, its conjugate co uh, quadrature to the, the phase coherence. So we must know a uh, useful parameter for, met for metrology to have this, this, this squeezing, because the squeezing has to do with metrology. So we define this uh, useful 
parameter here, uh, Cs, which is the, the number squeezing parameter divided by the coherence, because we need to know like if the number is the amplitude of the, the particles is uh, squeezed, the other quadrature will be anti-squeezed, but we have to do a balance there to have a, a better solution. So uh, with this, we can set like optimum values for each uh, for each parameter, and there's something nice about this because uh, the paper talks about entanglement between the atoms because the density matrix cannot be dividable by atoms. So this operator as well, the useful oper the useful parameter for uh, for metrology. Uh, is, the, is to a, a useful method to see entanglement. So if it is like uh, less than one, it will be it, it will reveal that the atoms are entangled. Okay. So there's a limit for the squeezing that is uh, that is the the term determined by the the thermal fluctuations of the field that is here, if the, the temperature is higher than the, the plasma energy. But if you consider like the, the tunneling energy between two condens condensate wells and the, uh, the inner at interaction energy between uh, in each well, we can see that uh, if you do a preparation that is, we do a shallow lattice depth and we start increasing it adiabatically so it's very slow increasing of the depth of the, the lattice, we'll see that the, the tunneling energy will decrease. So if the, the tunneling energy decreases, it will represent as the, the, this process is adiabatic, this will represent a effective cooling of the condensates because we are losing energy but we ke uh, we keep the 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 system. Uh, so for just to to conclude here, uh, we can see like a uh, uh, dependence on on the number squeezing and the barrier height of the the lattice, and we can set a optimal numbers here for the the squeezings of the optimal squeezing parameters, and that's it. Thank you for your attention. If there is some questions, we're happy to answer. Questions? Uh, I just have one question related uh, to the way in which you write your spin operators, uh, you are using Schwinger bosons approach, or yes, okay. yes, uh, yes. Basically, the idea is that, uh, as Felipe said, we can have a super st superstructure in the uh, spinning operators which follow certain algebra, the Lie algebra, uh, using uh, creation and destruction of operators which conserve number of total number of particles. I'm curious, how many atoms do they get entangled like this? How many atoms do they claim to be entangled? No, they don't claim anything about the number ah, of okay. atoms. Uh, okay, okay. Yeah, uh, they, just they, they just say uh, like there's about a thousand atoms per, per site. So that will be maybe the, the number of entangled atoms. Maybe I can, we can highlight just uh, the, it's like basically they, uh, they demonstrate that if we are below this uh, boundary, we have uh, squeeze states which are already entangled. Uh, maybe one thing that we can say is like, yeah, for us it's more important these parameters sigma s, cs, because it's useful for metrology, but even though if we have cn, in this, uh, for instance in this point, it's already entangled. So all the states are entangled in, in the atoms. Thank you.
Okay, so point uh, left. Uh, uh, uh. So, hello, everybody. Um, hello. We are uh, Marcus Prado, Mateo Londoño, and Matius Fernandez. And we're going to talk about uh, Anderson localization of a uh, non -interact interacting Bose Einstein condensate. So, the first, uh, first of all, I want to, this is not working properly, maybe because we are using. PowerPoint, sorry. I don't know what this. Oh, that. Okay, let's move. Now this is working. So uh, let's introduce briefly what is Anderson localization. Anderson localization refers to the suppression of diffusion of a wave in uh, disordered media. Uh, this comes from the multiple scattering effects of uh, wave propagating in a, multiple in a disordered media, and it was proposed uh, by Philip Anderson in the context of propagation of electrons in uh, semiconductors. When we have a, a semiconductor, electrons can move uh, through the, the, let's say, the wire, but once we have some impurities, we have disorder in the media, and then multiple scattering produce an effective localization of the uh, electron waves. Uh, uh, Anderson localization can take place not only in quantum waves, but also in classical waves. In fact, people have observed it in uh, sound waves, electromagnetic waves, Bose Einstein condensates, and the ones we are going to show you. So uh, we can classify Anderson localization, for example, uh, by means of uh, different transport regimes. We had, if we don't have any uh, disorder in the media, we have the ballistic uh, regime, where you have an initial wave packet, and then the initial wave packet uh, start to uh, spread out. And the signature is that uh, your uh, mean square displacement goes as T square. Yeah, that's the usual ballistic uh, regime. Then we have also the diffusive, uh, diffusive regime when you have uh, a little bit of disorder in the media. So your initial wave packet uh, starts to spread out, but it's now slowly. And for a long time, your mean square deflection goes as T, linear, linearly with T. But once you add a lot of disorder, or well, once you add a certain amount of disorder to your media, your wave packet is going to remain uh, unchainly. I mean, it, it, it remains well localized in the time, and the mean square displacement only has some fluctuation, but they are really, really small. Uh, the other way you can characterize this kind of localization is using, uh, of course, momentum distribution. If we use the uh, Heisenberg, uncertainty, Heisenberg uncertainty principle, we know that uh, uh, extend wave packets in the configuration space is going to give us a well-defined, well-localized wave packet in the momentum space and uh, vice versa in the sense of we have a well-localized wave packet in the configuration space, we're going to have a non-localized wave packet in the momentum space. So these are the ways we're going to characterize uh, Anderson localization. Okay, so now about the specific case of the of the, the paper that we chose, they want to study the properties of Anderson localization on, and localization uh, in the uh, using uh, BEC as the as the system they want to study because creating the BEC uh, through the BEC th they can control all the parameters uh, all the interactions they uh, on the system. So this is this is uh, in uh, an interesting uh, system to study. And then they uh, put the BEC into an optical lattice. First, they, they create an uh, optical lattice with uh, uh, one laser in a standing wave uh, 
configuration and then put a second one with another frequency uh, to create the, the perturbation on the first optical lattice. In this way, they create one dimensional optical lattice that is uh, a, qu a quasi periodic optical lattice. Uh, this way, considering that the BEC doesn't have any interactions and, uh, uh, and you have the tie binding regime because of the optical lattice, th then you can describe your system by this non interacting harbor or the Aubrey Andre Hamiltonian. And then uh, th the terms on the Hamiltonian, the, the bras and cats are the states in each of one of the sites of your optical lattice. Then the parameter J is the site to site tunneling energy that depends mainly on the primary uh, lattice potential. The parameter delta is the disordered strength that depends on the second uh, lattice potential. And then the parameter beta is very important in this uh, study because it is the ratio between the, the first uh, laser light and the second one. And uh, it's important that uh, it's not an, uh, they are not proportional. It, the ratio between them is not an integer. So they, s they uh, say it's an incommensurate, incommensurate wavelength. And in this kind of configuration, the you can define a delta C that is a, a critical disorder value that below this critical disorder, uh, if you have a disorder strength uh, below this, this regime, you uh, below this critical disorder value, you have a diffusive regime and above you have the localized regime. And then to obtain the, the images on the experiments, they do uh, they study, as Matteo was saying, uh, both spatial and momentum distributions. For the spatial one, they study using the time of flight technique. They release the trapping of the BEC and then study how the, uh, through absorption imaging, uh, how the, the cloud behaves. And for the momentum distribution, it's similar, but in this case, the width of the of the momentum distribution is inversely proportional to the spatial distribution. So here we have the here we have the uh, results of the experiments. Uh, uh, the absorption images ca uh, captures the evolution of the cloud as it expands. So we can really see different transport regimes that is different dynamics depending on the disorder strength. Uh, qualitatively, we c we the images confirm that above a certain amount of disorder, the expansion of the cloud is really suppressed, like in this image here. Uh, quantitatively. If, if we I, we compare the the size of the wave packets at a fixed evolution time, we see that it it keeps its initial size for large disorders. So this is a strong evidence of the onset of localization that is induced by disorder, which is precisely the Anton localization. Uh, we can also find additional signatures for Anton localization by analyzing the final shape of the wave packet. Uh, the authors perform a fit of the spatial profile of the wave packets, which shows it goes from a Gaussian shape to an exponential decay as the disorder is increased. Uh, and uh, the, this crossover uh, between these two uh, shapes here occurs around the same uh, disorder strength above which the expansion of the cloud is suppressed. So this is another uh, evidence for internal localization in the system. Conversely, uh, we go now focus on, on momentum space. The experiment, the experiment has shown that the distribution, the momentum distribution gets wider as the disorder is increased here from top for to below. Uh, in particular, it goes from a Bragg-like pattern that is typical of periodic lattice to smooth and wider distributions. In, uh, in the case of the distributions in the localized regime, the, the, the width of the momentum distribution are on the same order of the primary lattice vector. Uh, with the uncertainty principle with uh, position and momentum, this indicates that the localized states are confined in space uh, to individual lattice sites. And notice also the overall agreement with the numerical simulations, which indicates that this system indeed is is, is able to simulate a, a tight a tight binding Hamiltonian. So uh, we can say that this work in this work, Enzo localization is experimentally observed in a Boltzmann icing constant. Actually, this work was published together with another one from a lens aspects group, and, th and they provide the first direct demonstrations of lo localization of matter waves. 
Uh, in addition, this work serves as a good illustration that this kind of system with ultra, ultra cold atoms are uh, are really good to simulate complex quantum phases. Uh, thank you for your attention. Saban, Subramanian, Santiago Zamora, Sebastian Ayala Vasquez. Ah, yes, sorry. Which file is Can you hear me? Uh, okay. Greetings. We uh, start uh, talk about about the paper. Uh, call it precision measurement of gravity with cold atoms in a optical test and comparison with classical gravimeter. This paper is uh, an essential uh, experimental. Then we start with the uh, experimental stuff. Well, uh, in, this, in the, this figure, we have two setups. In the left side is the uh, setup with uh, cold atoms, and the uh, right side, we have the uh, Microsoft interferometer, who is used for classical uh, estimation of constant of gravity. In the left one, we start with a laser. Uh, we uh, divide uh, the, the, the laser beam, and after that, in the in the middle, we have a uh, many device. We can we control the modulation uh, of the of the setup because we are uh, working with a blotch uh, uh, oscillation. Well, the most important thing is here. When the laser uh, arrive here, we have two mirrors in the in the top and the below and the laser uh, impact in the mirror and return and impact again. In the center, we have uh, the atoms of a strong tune, and in the uh, blue uh, arrows and the red arrows, we have a mop, a um, magneto-optical uh, trap, when we can compense the effect of the gravity and keep the uh, atoms in the center of the cavity. But, uh, because uh, the effect of the, um, this device and the gravity, uh, the atoms takes a form like a disk. Then, with all this uh, experimental setup, we can control the modulation and uh, start the, um, the measurements for a uh, rich uh, a more pre precision in the determination of constant of gravity. Thank you. So this is the <coughs> atom distribution in a vertical space in the vertical optical lattice. In the vertical optical lattice, uh, uh, by changing the frequency of the uh, optical depth, they are allowing to uh, expand in the inside the gravity. So when allowing the expansion uh, the, the from the distribution, they calculate the, uh, the effect of the gravity on the distribution of the atom. So in the x-axis is the modulation of the frequency of the optical lattice potential. In the y-axis is the cloud size. When changing the frequency of the optical lattice, how the size is uh, varying inside the vertical uh, gravity. 
So when modulation frequency match with the block oscillation, the atoms start to tunnel between uh, one lattice to one optical depth to another, another uh, depth. Then in this way, they allow to uh, expand the atoms. So from the vertical and horizontal distribution, they calculate the gravity, uh, the force due to the gravity on the atoms. Here they tabulated the uncertainty due to the uh, experimental correction uh, from the earlier experiments. Here actually in this paper, they have compared uh, the another results and they reported the how accuracy from the earlier experiments also in the classical observations. So they have also reported the some two orders of magnitude accuracy and some advantage in viewing the block oscillations in this paper. And for example, here, the how the answer is varying in the first line. When there is no correction in the lattice wavelength, the answer is two, like that they have reported. And also here, they have uh, find out the two major variations in the G, uh, the acceleration due to the gravity. And uh, they have uh, uh, really nearly 20 set of values they have re recorded from uh, the same lab from one meter space and uh, some uh, 15 centimeter uh, height they have compared with the earlier results and uh, so next uh, is going to thank you okay so so th these are the results uh so this is a set of 21 determinations of the constant of, of gravity um and well the the error bars uh, come from the uh, from the fitting that uh, Savary talked about and also from the previous, uh, the some some of these uh, uh, errors, uh, systematic errors. Uh, so then they took the, the the mean value, and what they obtained is the 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 this red value over here, um, and then they compare it with the with the blue one, which comes from the Michelson interferometer, uh, which he presented at the beginning. Um, and well, they, they found these, uh, these, these two values, right? Um, so n then in the, in the last part of the article, they uh, obtained G uh, by measuring the momentum distribution of the block oscillations. So um, they do pretty much the same. They first load the atoms to the vertical lattice and then apply an amplitude modulation burst. Uh, so this is basically to create an interference in the time of flight. So they can, um, the, the, the peaks of the block's oscillations are enhanced. Um, then uh, well they turn the modulation off and let the atomic cloud evolve for a free time t. Switch off the confinement to measure the momentum distribution through absorption pictures of the cloud. So this is a, th these are the, the, absorb the, the pictures of the cloud, um, the, the momentum distribution. So here, uh, well, our, our complete cycles of the block oscillations for different times, uh, initial times and longer times. Uh, after, after well, 17 seconds, the block oscillations uh, start to disappear. And while well, they obtain this value for the, for the, through this method, they obtain this, uh, this value of the, uh, for the gravity, right? Um, that, that's pretty much they do, all they do. Questions? So, yeah, how they differentiate the distribution due to the momentum and uh, uh, due to the gravity? So, how they differentiate the distribution? Actually, the, 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 the atoms are distributing inside the gravity, right? Okay, <laughs> then it's okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, well, I think in when I read the paper, it's 
briefing uh, when we were some we are in the gym or in our camp and we we fell up on the I don't remember the, the yeah, word for I for think there is some briefing in the camp there is camp there. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And then um, then with the mob the magneto optical uh, strap you can control uh, with the uh, red uh, arrow you can control the temperature and uh, for uh, to say the, the paper with the uh, blue one you control uh, the position okay okay thank you we will discuss later <laughs> 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 uh, i was going to ask so uh, if you can measure gravity uh, with this scheme why don't we use it nowadays uh, to measure gravity. Thank you. Here they have mentioned that the better the accuracy to our uh, magnetos. Yes. Their accuracy. I, I they did the, the computer. In this paper they have mentioned that they have uh, improved the accuracy. Okay. And also uh, one more thing, they have in, in this paper they, they make the usability of the black uh, black hole. Yeah. Last group uh, of Nicola Vera and uh, Nicola, uh, Vera. <laughs> Nicola Vera and Nicola Vera. <laughs> okay, so this is a pointer and left right. Okay. Ah, si. Sí. Uh, pointer, cierto? <laughs> tut, tut. Okay, so uh, hi everyone. Uh, we are uh, Muriel Boneto, Nicolas Vera, and Nicolas Vera, Nicolas Vera. <laughs> and <laughs> we are going to talk to you about this paper, which is called uh, Observation of Vortex Lattices in Bose Einstein Condensates. Uh, just a remark uh, in the big boss position here is uh, Ketterle, which is the person who got the, one of the person who chaired the, the Nobel Prize for the first realization of the Bose-Einstein condensate. Okay, so uh, first of all, I want to talk about the uh, quantization of circulation. Okay, uh, when you rotate a quantum object, the vorticity is going to distribute in the most uh, uniform way. Okay, which is similar to what happens to a rigid body uh, but when you consider the, the, the circulation of the of the of a line of the field velocity of the velocity, uh, you will have that it is quantized in units of uh, h over m, being m the mass of uh, of the particles. Okay, uh, it is predicted that the vortex area density that is going to happen in the in a quantum object, uh, it is going to be from of this way, like. It when omega is like the rotation frequency, the angular rotation frequency, and the angular momentum per particle is going to be uh, uh, proportional to the number of vortex that are going to form in the in the in the superfluid, and it what happens is that the the most e energetically uh, efficient way of arranging uh, the vortices that are going to uh, appear in the superfluid is a regular triangular uh, structure. Okay, and this was due to Kachenko who did the calculation. And the thing is that the vorticity in superfluids is equ equivalent to the problem of, uh, of the flux spinning in superconductors, okay, in type su two superconductors. Uh, there are going to be vortices of, uh, of uh, cop copper pairs, uh, which uh, follow the same uh, vorticity rules as uh, particles in a superfluid. And for this experiment in particular, uh, the people uh, grabbed a, um, a Bose-Einstein condensate and they made it rotate with a technique of perturbation of, uh, of super surface perturbation. Okay, thank you. Oops. All right, so now for the experimental procedures, the authors use sodium atoms, five times 10 to the seven sodium atoms contained in a cylindrical trap 
and their vari varying aspect ratios. So for most of the for most of the results, however, they used a weak trap of 84 hertz in the radial direction and 20 hertz on the actual one. The main parameters of the condensate can be seen in the table. So they had a chemical potential of 310 nanokelvin, a peak density of 4.3 times 10 to the 14 inverse centimeter cube, a Thomas Fermi radius of 29 micrometers and a healing length of 0.2 micrometers. In order to generate this vortex lattice, they used a blue detuned laser and a two axis optical deflector. That generates this symmetrical uh, laser pattern around the condensate, as you can see here, that it can be rotated over a variable frequency. So the procedure is basically they ramp up the power of this laser over 20 milliseconds, then they hold it over a variable steering time at a frequency omega, and then they ramp it down over 20 milliseconds. After that, the condensate is e equilibrated over a variable hold time in the magnetic trap, and then they switch off the magnetic trap to let the condensate expand over 35 milliseconds. The final size the condensate reaches was of around 1,000 micrometers on the radial direction and 600 on the axial one. Um, the imaging is done by taking a slice of the center of the condensate of around 50 to 100 micrometers and they pump it from the F equal one to two hyperfine state. Then they use a pulse probe resonant to the F equal one to two transition to take the image. The pump was over 50 milliseconds and the probe was over five microseconds. So um, with this experiment, but they get, uh, I'm sorry, they get a lattices of up to 130 vortici vortices and they remark strongly that they are almost free of like, um, I don't remember what defects, thank you. <laughs> and they're almost free of defects, uh, even around the boundary and uh, in most of the realizations. I mean, they have some with defects, but not all. Uh, here is plotted the number of vortexes versus the steering frequency for two different uh, steering times. Um, the number of vortices, vortices can be estimated from the uh, density and it's an estimation and it's linear with the steering frequency, but which is the line uh, that is like over there. Uh, they find that only around 60 hertz, it's near the predicted number uh, for other steering frequencies is below. And that's the uh, traps radial frequency divided by the square root, which uh, because of the trap asymmetry is induced a uh, quadrupolar uh, surface excitation when they're around that uh, frequency, and that's why the number of vortices increases. Um, oh, and so they use, they change the serum frequency to get different numbers of, vort uh, of uh, vortices, vortices in their lattice. As for, they discuss also the temporal evolution of the condensate. Here it's from like after the steering time is over until the, where there is a structure, sort of, maybe in the, in the computer is clearer. And so until it crystallizes and then the cloud starts getting smaller because of collisions. But even after 40 seconds, they still find uh, vortexes in surviving in the middle of the condensate, uh, which is far uh, larger than what's predicted by theory. Uh, for their system, it's like 100 milliseconds. No, like a second, sorry. And they don't discuss why is that, they just say like this happens. And lastly, what they conclude is that their experiment is really good to the, for um, studying vortex thresholds, like the steering frequency for which you start getting thermal, thermally stable vortexes. Uh, because predicti uh, the predicted one, for example, for their system, uh, it's, this one, but they find experimentally this one. So, um, and this happens not only in their experiment, but all the ones they cite that came before. And so, uh, they, uh, the discussion they make around this difference is 
only that they can uh, they can discard the anomalous modes as one of the uh, origins because they do this with really different trap aspect ratios. I mean, they change it, and uh, but they only present this as a unsolved problem at the moment that their experiment is good, good to explore. And they also discuss the upper limit frequency after which uh, they are no longer stable, the vortices. And it depends on the angular moment and frequency of these um, uh, like surface excitations. And they don't, uh, like what they say is typical experiments up to the moment only had L, L equal to two, the mom angular momentum two. And so that really restricts the range of frequencies. But there's, uh, they present a strong, um, because of its characteristics, a system resistant to strong deformations. And so they can study the threshold better and more clearly. Oh, that's it. Ah, thank you. I'm curious about the regularity of the <laughs> pattern of vortices because usually when you have vortices, uh, then you want to study the dynamics, the nucleation, uh, the cascade, etc. Uh, how is it compatible with the regular lattice? So the regular lattice, uh, the calculations from Kacheco are a little bit involved, but it is the disposition that minimizes the energy of the system. So that is why they arrange naturally in a in this kind of lattice. Uh, yeah. And um, okay. So did this? Ah, okay. So it, uh, but why? Uh, sorry. Uh, why does it become smaller with time? Ah, okay. So they lose some uh, atoms. Uh, yeah. Uh, so it's not a vortex dynamics. Uh, no, no. Uh, Actually, it, it might be something different because, uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> but, but there is a little detail that I want to address that uh, the, the problem is analogous to the type two uh, superconductor in a magnetic field, but the difference is that in the superconductor, uh, the vortices uh, have like a vanishing uh, force interaction between them, but in the superfluid is uh, the contrary. Uh, the, the vortex interact between them uh, so they, they start to have like collisions because they, they interact, they, they, they exert force between themselves. So yeah, that's why uh, the system decays as contrary of the type two superconductor. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, it's not, thank you very much.